إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد So we began this book a few weeks ago الأجوبة المفيدة عن أسئلة المناهج الجديدة which is basically referring to a book with beneficial answers to questions concerning the modern day innovated methodologies and beliefs. Questions that were posed to a Sheikh Al Allama Sali bin Fawzan bin Abdullah Al Fawzan Hafidhullah Ta'ala, a member of the committee of the Kibar Al Ulama and also a member of the, of the permanent committee, the Lejna Tudaima Lil Ifda, for the issuance of fatawa. These questions are related, of course, as the <coughs> title suggests, concerning the position of Ahlul Sunnati Wal Jama'ah and the Madhab of the Salaf with respect to various orientations that have appeared in the modern era. <clears throat> so the question today is question number three. Where in the Sheikh he was asked and it was requested of him, Arju at or that I request from you some clarification. What is the intent behind the term Fiqhul <clears throat> Waqi' which is the understanding of current affairs. So they're asking him, <clears throat> what is the intent of the term fiqhul waqi' or understanding of the current affairs, the fiqh of the current affairs? Because the term is applied unrestrictedly. And what is intended in this sense is the linguistic meaning and not the sharia meaning. So they're asking him concerning this term, of current affairs and the fiqh of the current affairs. <clears throat> and of course this question actually, if you look at the context in which and the era in which this question was asked, <clears throat> then we are referring back to the early 90s. And that was at the height of the fitna of the people of takfir, ikhwan al-muslimin, as-sururiya, qutubiya and the various political and politi uh, politically active movements of that era which were coming to the forefront after the Gulf War, during and after the first Gulf War, and that was the war wherein Saddam Hussein and his army had entered into Kuwait. And he sent in his army and his troops and there was much killing and theft of the land, imprisonment of Muslims, and then there were threats of attack against the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and during that period of time, the scholars such as Sheikh Ibn Baz, <coughs> Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz, Sheikh Muhammad bin Salih al Uthaymeen, and the rest of the scholars of that era were asked by the rulers of that time whether it was permissible in that situation to seek the help and the aid of the non-Muslims to prevent the, uh, prevent the attack or the imminent attack or the potential attack of Iraq into the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So those scholars such as Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen and Sheikh Bin Baz at the head of them and he was the Mufti of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia of that time and he is the Imam and the Mujaddid Sheikh Abdul Aziz Ibn Baz Rahimahullah So he issued a fatwa that it is permissible to seek assistance from the unbelievers against an enemy who seeks to harm the believers and therefore the American troops and the Western Alliance 
and the Allied forces were allowed to enter the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia on its eastern board and that is the eastern side of the kingdom in the area of the Mam and the Haran and those areas and military bases were established and many of the countries participated in that from the West and from the Muslim lands and of course from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia itself and many of the other lands also assisted in its defense such as Pakistan and other countries that they came to the aid of the kingdom to prevent the attack of the Iraqi army which was a Ba'athist uh, army rooted in the ideology of communism and Marxism and Arab socialism <clears throat> and during that period of time the Iraqis actually did uh, fire some missiles, the Scud missiles into the kingdom of Saudi Arabia so in that time many of these groups that they came to the forefront al qutubiyin the followers of Sayyid Qutb who some of them and his brother of course the, the brother of Sayyid Qutb Muhammad Qutb was at that time in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia because he was exiled there in the early 1970s and likewise he had several students from them was Salman al Awda, Safar al Hawali. So they started writing against the scholars. And likewise, the likes of Abdul Rahman Abdul Khaliq, who was the leader or the, uh, or the religious leader of Jam'iya, Ihya al Turath al Islami. And likewise, Nasr al Umar. And other than them, Muhammad Surur Zain al Abideen who had at that time in the early 90s been uh, he was initially in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and then he was exiled to Kuwait and then he ended up in Birmingham and at that time he was living he had his offices on Langley Road just across the road from where we are now and from there he produced a magazine a Sunnah magazine which Sheikh Al-Albani described as al bidah magazine through which he propagated the ideas of khuruj and rebellion against the rulers causing agitation incitement in the Muslim lands and so the scholars refuted all of these figureheads Salman al awda Safar al-Hawali who wrote a book Zahiratul Irja which was the book of the uh, the appearance of Irja fi fikr al-Islami in the in Islamic thought and it was a refutation of Sheikh al-Albani in which he claimed that Sheikh al-Albani in his bid'ah of Irja was worse than the Jahmiyyah. So there were huge accusations in these books and all of it was related to the political situation in uh, the Gulf countries at that time. So Abdul Rahman Abdul Khaliq likewise who was an Egyptian living in Kuwait and he died I think maybe two years ago or thereabouts and uh, Sheikh Muqbil refuted him he studied under Sheikh Al-Albani. He studied in the Islamic University of Medina. He was a companion of some of the major scholars of our times, like Sheikh Rabi and so on. And then after, after he left the Islamic University, he moved to Kuwait. In Kuwait, he became a part of this movement or this organization, Jam'iyat Ihya Al-Turath Al-Islami. And they spread their wings because it was a very powerful, financially strong organization that set up Marakis and Masajid and funded du'at across the dunya in Sudan, in Somalia, in Britain, in Pakistan, in India, in almost every country of Africa, in the United States of America, in Canada. They had workers and they came in the garbs of Salafiyah. So they claimed Salafiyah because of Abdul Rahman Abdul Khaliq. Sheikh Al-Albani, Rahimahullah, he said, that Abdul Rahman Abdul Khaliq before he came to us to the Islamic University of Medina that he was an Ikhwani so we changed him from the ideas of Al-Ikhwan Al-Muslimin to Salafiyya so he left us upon Salafiyya and then he went to Kuwait and they said in Kuwait he returned Sheikh Al-Albani said in Kuwait he returned back to the ideology of Al-Ikhwan Al-Muslimin <clears throat> so Sheikh Muqbil likewise refuted them Sheikh Al-Albani refuted them Sheikh Al Albani described this movement, and you can put them all into one broad pot, and that is the pot of Ikhwan al Muslimin. So, even though they had slightly different approaches, they all came under the banner 
of Bannawiya or the followers of the ideologies of Al-Hassan Al-Banna, who is the founder of Al-Ikhwan Al-Muslimin in the 1920s, and also under many of the influences and the ideas of the writings of Sayyid Qutb, from, <laughs> who was executed, I think, in 1966 or 65, Wallahu, uh, one of the two anyway. But nevertheless, when the Egyptian authorities came down uh, firmly against Ikhwan al-Muslimin after the execution of Sayyid Qutb, and that was under the leadership of Jamal Abdel Nasser, then Saudi Arabia opened its doors to protect these Muslims from being imprisoned and tortured and to protect them from repression. So Saudi Arabia opened up its doors thinking that these people will come over and be grateful because Saudi Arabia is a Muslim country, Islamic State. Tawheed is widespread. So as many of these exiles came into the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, like Muhammad Qutb, the brother of Sayyid Qutb, they did not cease with their agitation and political agitation, unbeknown in reality to the kingdom. It was unknown to the kingdom that this was taking place, so they were, some of them became teachers in schools, colleges, universities, as Muhammad Qutb himself. So they began to nurture a generation upon the ideas of Al-Ikhwan al-Muslimin, Sayyid Qutb, and Hassan al-Banna. And this was a political ideology, a political movement that sought to highlight the errors and the mistakes in Islamic societies, the injustices as they saw them, the issues of social, of, 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 of social unrest or the issues of social deprivation and economics and military strength of these countries and their weakness or their relative weakness. So this is what they started to indoctrinate their students with. And from them was Safar al-Hawali, Sulman al-Awda. And in the early days that they got close to some of the Kibar al-Ulama, like Safar al-Hawali, Sulman al-Awda, came close to Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz, such as Sheikh bin Baz would praise them. Even in the, in the, uh, in the early, late 80s, early 90s, <coughs> that you know, uh, Safar al-Hawali wrote a book against the refu a refutation against the Ashaira. In fact, that was his PhD. And Sheikh bin Baz praised him, as did some of the other scholars. The scholars of Medina, they knew them, and they knew them well. So as these issues started coming out after the Gulf War, then this term became a slogan, fiqh al What do the scholars really know about the current affairs? What do they really know about the plots of the Americans and the plots of the Jews and the plots of the kuffar? So they started making comments about the scholars, that the scholars they don't know. Sheikh bin Baz doesn't know. Sheikh Al-Albani, even if he does know, we're not concerned because he's a murji. So anyone who did not agree with them, that they would revile them in private. So they spoke against Sheikh Muqbil. But living in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, it was hard to speak against Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz because Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz was the mufti of the kingdom. And he was loved by all of the people. And his knowledge had, in his time, there was no equal in, to the knowledge of Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz in terms of understanding the affairs of the Ummah and giving fatawa. There was no one who had given more fatawa than Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz in his time. So they started speaking about the scholars in a general manner. Oh, these scholars, they only know about the sighting of the moon for the beginning of Ramadan and the end of Ramadan. Ask them about the menzies of women. Ask them about the postnatal bleeding. Ask them about miscarriages. Then they will give you answers for that. As for the fiqh al as for the understanding of the current political situation of the world today, you cannot go to them. This was what they were propagating. So this is what they were spreading. And Muhammad, Z Muhammad Surur Zain al Abidin, this is what he used to say, but he was more brazen. And there is no doubt that the likes of Safar al-Hawali, Salman al-Awda, that they met up with Muhammad Surur Zain al abidin And this is, of, of course, after him. He's, he's named the, the group as sururiya or the political movement as sururiya is named after him. So when he moved to the United Kingdom in Kuwait, they used to visit him. There is ample evidence to show 
that the that these they were they were given the title the Sahwa scholars or the callers to the to the awakening of the Ummah. They were called the awakening scholars, Safar al Hawali, because they were it was said that they are awakening the Ummah from their slumber. So they would visit Muhammad Sarur in Kuwait. Then Muhammad Sarur, who was very tightly in line with the Ikhwan movement in Kuwait. Then after that, Kuwait realized and they also banished him. And he ended up in London, from London. He moved to Birmingham. From Birmingham, he set up a printing press. The whole printing press machinery was on Langley Road. He actually bought the whole printing press and used to print books, bind them, staple them, and then smuggle them into the Muslim countries. He had fax machines in there, several fax machines that he used to fax through the khutb for the khatibs to give in the Gulf countries. So he used to write the khutb, today you must talk about the situation in Iraq. Today you must talk about the situation of Israel. You should talk about the, the rulers and how they're behaving. So he used to fax thousands of them because the books were banned in those countries. So he used to, and in those days, of course, uh, fax machine was the easiest way. So they, thousands and thousands of khutb and articles used to be faxed across to the, to the, to the Gulf countries. And from here, he started a movement in London, and that is Al Muntada Al Islami. Muntada Al Islami is a group, and it is a, a, a masjid now, and an Islamic center that is based in London, in Fulham. And it is Al Muntada Al Islami, and that was under the auspices of Muhammad Surur Zain Al Abidin. Sheikh Mukbil spoke against them, Sheikh bin Baz spoke against them, Sheikh Al Albani spoke against them. Sheikh Rabi spoke against them. Sheikh Muhammad Aman Jami spoke against them. But in these early days, it was something that was not well known amongst the people. So they began with this idea of fiqh al-waqi'ah. Fiqh al The people need to know what's happening in the world. The people need to know what's, what the current situation is, what's, what's, what's happening in the political arena. And this was all, the motivation of all of this was to incite the people against their rulers, this is after they were given refuge when they were under oppression and they were imprisoned and their rights were taken away from them in Egypt. So they were brought into the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and they started biting the hand that was feeding them. And this became clear in the mid-90s and eventually when it reached Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz that this was the conduct of Safar al-Hawali. And Safar al-Hawali and Salman al were both Saudis, by the way. But their teachers were from Ikhwan, Muhammad Qutb predominantly, Muhammad Surur also, and others. So, when Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz, Sheikh Rabi had already started refuting them, as did Muhammad Aman Jami. When the information came to Sheikh, Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz, and an official question came to him about the audios and the tapes, and he heard them, and he saw that they were agitating the people. They were talking about the people and the, and the fact that the Muslim rulers aren't judging by what Allah has revealed. And they are seeking the aid of the kuffar. And what are these American troops doing in the Muslim lands and so on. So then Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz, he realized that what they're doing is agitating the people into protest, marching, rebellion even. And some of their writings were becoming extremely dangerous and volatile. So Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz gave the fatwa that their audios and their lectures and their articles and their khutb, all of them should be banned from the kingdom. And they should be prevented from, from talking. That fatwa came from Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz and Lajna to Daima against this movement, Safar al-Hawali, Salman al-Awda. Ihya Turath al-Islami were linked to, these, to this ideology through Abdul Rahman, Abdul Khaliq and other people. These people had a center in Birmingham, or they had not a physical center in terms of, a, in terms of a, an office, but they had a presence in Birmingham in Green Lane Masjid. Muhammad Surur Zainal Abedin used to give the rules in Green Lane Masjid in the 90s. Ihya Turath al-Islami used to organize lectures and camps. You know that topic that we covered last week, which was the topic of these... Uh, these Marakis uh, al-Sayfiya or these summer camps where they would take the youth out 
and they would, for the summer, they would educate them. Who were the teachers in those camps? Ikhwan, Qutubiyin, Sururiyin, those who were against the scholars. So what they wanted, they realized that the method to change the children is to get the children away from their parents into these summer camps to indoctrinate them. Now in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the origin of the parents is the parents think, okay, khair. It's tawheed, sunnah. It's better than sitting in front of the TV or just on the streets or in the shopping malls. Send them to these Islamic places through the summer so they can be educated. So they were doing that in Kuwait and they did it in Birmingham. So Ihyatulat al-Islami in Birmingham in the mid-90s organized summer camps. They would go out for five days, six days, a weekend. And they would take their speakers along with them. And they would have the people now, you've got a captivated audience because these youth have come just to listen to the sheikh. The sheikh is Turathi. Translator, one of their own translators, Abu Usama. So they had the whole mechanism in place. So they were duplicating, duplicating it across the world. They did the same in India. They would do the same in Sudan. They did the same in the United States of America and elsewhere. Spreading this ideology that we know the current affairs, we know the political situation, we know what these children and what these youth need to be upon. As for the scholars, yes, you can ask them about sujudu sahu. Yes, you can ask them about the irregular bleeding, the istihada of a woman. As for the knowledge of the current affairs and the rulership, come to us. This is what they used to say. So they started criticizing the scholars openly, but they wouldn't name them initially. Abdul Rahman Abdul Khaliq himself, he spoke against the author of Adwal Bayan, which is the tafsir of the Quran, one of the greatest scholars of the last generation, Muhammad Amin Shanqiti, rahimahullah ta'ala, Ali Imam. He was the Shaykh of Abdul Rahman Abdul Khaliq when Abdul Rahman Abdul Khaliq was in the Jamia in Medina University. When Sheikh Rabi was there and the other scholars there, he was, the, he was one of the teachers. So he said this, there was a teacher that we used to have, you could ask him about the finest and the most minute details of Tahara. And you could ask him about the types of water and all of the fiqh that surrounds the purification and the usage of water and what pollutes it and what doesn't. He said he was a genius. But if you asked him anything about fiqh al waqi about the, about the situation of the ummah, then he was the most ignorant. Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz was told that there is a, Abdul Rahman al Khaliq is saying this, even though Muhammad Amin Shankiti's name wasn't mentioned, but everyone knew he was talking about him. Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz refuted him and commanded that he make tawbah. And this me just giving you this, this brief insight into what was taking place in the early to mid 90s is just a, a drop in the ocean of the activities of these, of these people in terms of publications and books and they reach right into the UK that's why many questions went from, the, from, went from Birmingham to Sheikh Muqbil to Sheikh Rabi'ah to Sheikh Ubaid al-Jabari and to other than them even to Sheikh al-Albani and others from the UK and to Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz, some questions were sent from the brothers in the United Kingdom because Ihya Turaf were active here. Abdul Rahman Abdul Khaliq was active here. Muhammad Surur Zainal Abedin was active here. Abdul Rahman Abdul Khaliq visited Birmingham. Adnan Arur, the Syrian, visited Birmingham, Green Lane Masjid. We never had this masjid then. This is where we used to pray. Muhammad Surur was in Green Lane Masjid. So these people came, Abdullah Sabt, who was with Ihya Turath, came to Green Lane Masjid. So these individuals were coming repetitively because they knew Birmingham was the heartland and East London as well. Birmingham and East London predominantly were the heartlands of Salafiyyah in Birmingham, if not in Europe and the West. Allahu Alam. So they focused upon these places and they used every tactic, money, bribery, they came to Abu Talha rahimahullah ta'ala and they offered him wealth to work for them. That whatever you want will pay you. And of course he refused. They wanted a translator. And he was the most prolific rahimahullah. 
and he refused. They came to speak to us and we refused to cooperate with them. So when the fatawa came from Sheikh Muqbil and the rulings came from Sheikh Muqbil warning against these organizations and Sheikh Muqbil was asked about Birmingham and our situation in Birmingham and Abdurrahman the Khaliq, he made tabdi'ah. He said this Abdurrahman the Khaliq is a mubtadi'ah, which is true. Sheikh Rabi wrote at least three books in refutation of him. Sheikh Rabi wrote in refutation of Salman al awda When Salman al awda tried to distinguish between Taifatul Mansura and Ahlul Hadith, he said these are two different groups that the Prophet Sallallahu is mentioning. The Ahlul Hadith and Taifatul Mansura are two different groups. So Sheikh Rabi wrote a book, Ahlul Hadith, Hum Taifatul Mansura. Because that's the haqq. Taifatul Mansura, Ahlul Hadith, they are the Taifatul Mansura, where he tried to make a distinction that one is a, a, a group that is a, a, a jihadist, you know, that they are people who go out and fight, and Ahlul Hadith, they are something else. So Sheikh Rabi refuted them. Sheikh Al-Albani refuted them. Rad after Rad after Rad came against them. But they had the money, they had the magazines, they had this shaitan living in Birmingham, Muhammad Surur, spreading their poison amongst the Shabab. So you can imagine the situation. It's like you brothers sitting here today, but we are in a foreign mosque. A masjid that is mixed up with these types of people. These are their conferences. These are their lecturers. These are, and they haven't changed, by the way. If anything, they've gotten worse. Greenland masjid, they've gotten worse, if anything. So they have become even more watered down from the menhaj of, of Salafiya. So... In the context of this, I mean, we're just looking at Birmingham, but imagine this is taking place on, 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 a, on a global scale. They're accusing the scholars of being agents of the West. So Muhammad Surur had a writing in which he said that the, that the, that, that the scholars of Saudi Arabia, talking about Sheikh bin Baz, and the legend of Daima, the likes of Sheikh, Sheikh uh, Ibn Uthaymeen, and Sheikh Al-Fawzan, and Sheikh Muhammad Aman, Sheikh Abdullah Ghudayan, Sheikh Abdul Muhsin, he said they are the slaves of the slaves of the slaves and their masters are Jews and Christians. That's what he said about Sheikh Abdul Aziz. And that's in these magazines. And these were the magazines that they were pushing across to the youth. That these scholars, they are just slaves. And their leaders are in Tel Aviv and Washington. This is what was being spread. And imagine this type of ideology at its lowest level, because in, amongst the Shabab, you can't say anything about Sheikh bin Baz. So how do you introduce this ideology? That there are scholars that you go to for your fiqh questions, Ramadan, fasting, Haid, Nifas, Halal and Haram. Then there's another group that you go to for international politics and geopolitics. And those scholars, they will tell you about that. So this is the reality of that era. So Sheikh Al-Fawzan is, is being asked in that time about fiqh al So This term was being used often and oft used. So he answered, <coughs> he said it used to be said, remember the question is the meaning of fiqh al from a linguistic and shari point of view. He said it used to be said from the that from the difficult affairs is to explain what is already clear. That's from the difficult matters, meaning that it's clear what fiqh al is. It is understanding of what's happening around you, the current situation. But he said, but however, it is so straightforward that sometimes to explain something that you say straightforward itself becomes difficult. Because of the talbis of the people, because of the deceit that the people play around words. He said the fiqh that is required in the Sharia and the fiqh that is sought after is the fiqh and understanding fiqh here meaning understanding literally is the fiqh of the book and the sunnah is the understanding of the book and the sunnah that is the truly required fiqh as for understanding the language then understanding the language is from the affairs that are mubah that are you know, allowable and something permitted that you learn the language. And it is not something that is an obligation upon the people. Understanding the language is knowing the meanings of the words, their derivatives 
and their letters and so on. And this is what is called fiqhul lugha, such as the book fiqhul lugha of Tha'alibi and others. So he said this, meaning the knowledge of the Arabic language is from the matters of completing or perfecting that which is required of knowledge. And from, and from that is, of course, learning the Arabic language. So that's, you know, as, as far as fiqh al-lugha is concerned, or understanding the language. However, when the term fiqh is used unrestrictedly, in a general sense, such as in the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ Where Allah has said, the meaning of which is, in Surah At-Tawbah, so that they may attain the fiqh of the deen, so that they may attain the fiqh of the deen, meaning so that they may attain understanding of the deen. And likewise, the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّحُهُ فِي الدِّينِ that whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes good for, then he gives him understanding, fiqh of the deen. The hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. And likewise, the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from Surah An-Nisa, ayah number 78, where Allah said, فَمَا لِهَا أُولَاءِ الْقَوْمِ لَا يَكَادُونَ يَفْقَهُونَ حَدِيثًا Where he said, subhanahu wa ta'ala, the meaning of which is, so what is wrong with these people that they don't understand any word, that they don't have fiqh of any of these words? And likewise the statement of Allah, وَلَكِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ Where Allah said, however, the munafiqeen, they do not understand. So here in all of these four proofs, the word fiqh is used. Munafiqoon, ayah number seven that was. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the term fiqh. And other than that, in the various hadith, and the various ayat, in the book of Allah, the term fiqh is used with the intent, the fiqh of the deen, understanding of the religion. So the intent by, these, by the usage of the term fiqh is fiqh of the deen, by knowing the rulings of the sharia and the ahkam of the sharia. And this is what is obligatory, and this is what is demanded and required and this is what is obligatory upon the Muslims to give concern to and give importance to and to learn this fiqh fiqh of what? the deen because there's one thing just to memorize something it is a completely different thing to understand what you are trying to memorize and what you are trying to read so understanding something is more important than just knowing that it is there or just storing it in your mind or having it in a book Understanding it is what is matloob. However, he said, Sheikh Al-Fawzan, these people, they do not intend that by the usage of the term fiqh al That's not what they understand. That's not what they, that's not what they intend. They don't intend fiqh al or the understanding of the language. Rather, with them, the meaning of fiqh al is to keep the people occupied and busy with the affairs of siyasa, of politics, and with political activism, and to incite the people, and to spend the time, or spend the time of the people, and turning their attention to these types of affairs, to this current affairs, what's happening in this country, what's happening in that country, what happened in the United Nations, what, what's happening in Washington, D.C., what's happening in Paris and France, to keep the people occupied with this. They said, oh, this is part of the deen. Say, how is that part of this? This is fiqh waqi. This is fiqh. See, what fiqh is this? I thought fiqh was the ahkam of the sharia, worshipping Allah, learning the aqidah, learning the deen, learning the methodology, learning how to pray, how to fast, jihad and so on. Learning these rules and these ahkam and then acting upon them. They said, no, this fiqh al That's ilm. So they are, you know, such as Hizb tahrir and some of these organizations. So they kept their people busy. We're just learning and learning and learning the names of presidents and what accord was made and what ruling was given and where the next set of troops are going, the way United Nations were sending their troops in Africa or in the Middle East. 
So this is what they were pursuing. So as we're learning the aqidah and we're learning how to worship Allah, learning the understanding of the deen, learning the siyasa sharia, meaning, you know, the sharia-based politics with respect to how you're supposed to deal with the rulers, because that's siyasa sharia, right? How to deal with the rulers, how to deal with the people, how to deal with organizations, how to deal with the mahkamah and the courts, how to deal with a ruler who commits sins, how to deal with the affairs between the people, the relationship between the ruled and the, the ruler and the citizens. And that is important, but that comes in the books of Aqidah, does it not? How to deal with the rulers, how to behave with them, how a Muslim behaves with each other. All of this was being taught, but what they intended by this was just the pursuit of political agitation and political activism. So then he said, as for the fiqh of the, of, of the Sharia rulings, then they call that, I mean, this is Sheikh Al Fawzan saying this, they call it fiqh al juz'iyat. Fiqh al juz'iyat, which is the fiqh of the, of the trivial matters. That's what they refer to the sharia. So they say, oh, you, yeah, you carry on learning. You know, like the, some, of the, uh, some of the Mu'tazila used to say about Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Abu Yusuf. They used to say these scholars, meaning Abu Hanifa and Abu Yusuf and the likes of uh, Imam Malik, all they know is about the undergarments of women, meaning the blood and the undergarments of women. That's all you can ask them. So what these people did was that they said, started saying the same about Sheikh bin Baz. Ah, Sheikh bin Baz about the number of talaqs. Ah, Sheikh bin Baz about Hayd and Nifas. Ah, Sheikh bin Baz in Ibn Thaymin about the start of Ramadan and the end of Ramadan. If you want to know what's happening in the world, you come to us. And their da'wah was, a lot of their da'wah was da'wah sirriya. It was a, it was a secret, secretive da'wah. It's almost like a, like a movement that only if you, if, if you are a part of the movement, you'd be given the information. Otherwise, there'll be just general indications. Yeah, Akhi, you need to uh, read, read this magazine. You know, read what's happening in Chechnya. Read what's happening in Moscow. Read what's happening in Washington, D.C. Look at how the rulers of the Muslim countries are going to the United Nations. Didn't you see, do you know how many Muslims got killed in Iraq after, the Ameri uh, after they invaded Kuwait? So they start, so this is how they begin. So they started referring to the Sharia, and this is what they refer to the Sharia till this day. That they refer to the ahkam of the Sharia as you are learning the little knowledge, we, we're learning the big knowledge. You are talking about the Shirk al Qubur, we're talking about the Shirk al Qusur. Whilst you, meaning you Salafis, are talking about the shirk of the graves, we're talking about the shirk of the qusur, of the palaces and the castles, of the, of, of where the presidents and kings live. So they say, yeah, so you're dealing with the trivial shirk, we're dealing with the big shirk in the palaces. And with the ideology came right at the, you know, which was, a, which was actually a natural progression into discussions about Tawheed al hakimiyah Because you can imagine, if this is the discourse that is present, one of them came out, Abdul Rahman al Khaliq, and those with him, they said, and they came out and they said, yes, there is Tawheed, and we believe in the Aqsam of Tawheed. But the Aqsam of Tawheed are four. Rububiyyah, Uluhiyyah, Asma wa Sifat, and Hakimiyyah. They invented the fourth category. Why? Because they'd already now started infiltrating the minds, and this is why the likes of these books are important. al Mufida. You know, these are beneficial answers to question concerning what? These manahij al-jadida. So now, imagine you're a Salafi, studying at the Islamic University of Medina. You're sitting in Durus. You've been raised upon Sifatul Salah of Shaykh al-Albani, upon the books of Aqidah of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab. And these people are teaching the same books, Aqid of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, but now they come and they say, oh, by the way, Tawheed is a four category, Tawheed al hakimiyah Don't you believe in the, in the hakimiyah of Allah? That Allah is the sovereign Lord, Allah is the king, judgment returns back to Allah. Say, yes, well, that's Tawheed al hakimiyah Where's the bid'ah in that? The infiltration began like this. We're dealing with this is the, we are, we are opposing the shirk of the qusur. The shirk that is taking place in the palaces. See, what shirk is taking place in the palaces? They say they don't judge by Allah is revealed. They are judging by taghut. This is shirk. So now we have to oppose the shirk of the qusur of the palaces with tawhid al-hakimiyah. 
Because everything that is shirk is opposed by tawheed, is refuted by the correct tawheed. So this is how they infiltrated this amongst the youth. And this became currency amongst almost all of the communities who ascribed themselves to tawheed and the sunnah. And huge splits started taking place because of these hizbiyun, because of these harakat and these movements, political, political movements of that age. So he said, Sheikh Al-Fawzan, they call it the fiqh of the trivial matters and the fiqh of Haydn nifas. There you go, exactly. They call it, meaning those political agitators and political activists, they started calling the fiqh of the sharia and knowledge of the sharia, they started calling the fiqh of Haid and nifas, the fiqh of the menstruation of women and the postnatal bleeding of women. And this was in order to disparage that knowledge and cause people to flee from it and away from being occupied with that to becoming occupied with politics. Then in the footnote, Sheikh Jamal al-Harithi, rahimahullah, he said, so it becomes clear that fiqh, that is the, the true fiqh and understanding that is required is of levels, is of types. He said, fiqh with the meaning of understanding the book and the sunnah, meaning the fiqh of the book and the sunnah, understanding the book and the sunnah, and to extrapolate rulings from the book and the sunnah. And that is the intent of, 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 of the sharia. Then there's the fiqh of the lugha arabiya, the understanding of the Arabic language. And this is the, this is the, the language of the kitab and the sunnah, and grammar, and morphology, sarf, and balagha, eloquence. And likewise, the derivations and the uh, connotations of words. Thirdly, the fiqh of the occurrences, current events that require judgments for the purpose of implementing the Sharia rulings upon them in a manner that is correct. So is there fiqh al waqi'? Yes, there is, of course. There is. You know, under, there is events that are taking place around us all the time. Understanding how to react to those events requires fiqh. Fiqh of what? Kitab and sunnah. Because the only way you can react and behave, you know, when there's, when, when there's turmoil taking place and there's tribulation and there's infighting and there's political agitation. So this is the current situation. That's the wadi'ah. Okay, so that's the waqi'ah. But having understanding of that means what? Just to know it? Ma'rifa of it? Of course not. Because you can become a scholar overnight. All you got to do is watch BBC till the morning and you'll be a scholar of current affairs of the dunya. But that's just having ma'rifa of what's taking place. Oh, this took place in Venezuela. This took place in the United States of America. That's taking place in Canada. This is taking place in Saudi Arabia. This is taking place in Pakistan and Bangladesh and India. So that's just ma'rifa. Having fiqh al is what? Is to have knowledge of the kitab and the sunnah, scholarly knowledge of the kitab and the sunnah and the way of the salaf, and then applying that in the situation that you are surrounded with. Who are the best place to do that? Scholars. It's not the jahil, it's not the baker or the car mechanic. Right? It's not the journalist. Journalist just goes around saying, oh, the, there's a new, you know, there's a new resolution being passed in the United Nations. That's just ma'rifa. That's just an event that's taking place. How you react to the event is built upon your knowledge of the kitab and the sunnah. And this is why you have scholars. So the scholars look at these situations, they say, right, this is taking place. So what does the student ask? The student asks, yeah, Sheikh, this event is taking place. How do we behave? What do we do? So the scholar says, right, if this political event has taken place or that social upheaval has taken place, this is how you behave because this is how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam behaved and this is how the Sahaba behaved and there is a qawl of Imam Ahmed and this is how Ibn Taymiyyah behaved and this is how it, because this issue resembles that issue. As for just seeing an event or seeing the sins of the, skull, of, of the rulers or seeing the mistakes of the rulers, or the misjudgment of the rulers and the mistakes of the rulers and then passing a judgment based upon emotion because you have five million people following you and you know 
All I have to do is shout and they will follow me. Because that's what these movements are. That's why Sheikh Al-Albani said, he said, what does Ihya Turath al-Islami do? They asked him, Ya Sheikh, is Jamiyat Ihya Turath al-Islami, by the way, they're still present in the UK, but they fund it through different channels now. The Da'wah is funded in the UK uh, through this Jamiyat Ihya Turath al-Islami, through individual mosques and organizations. So when Sheikh Al-Bani was asked about this organization, he said they're Hizbi. They are Hizbiyun. They're up on Hizbiya. Why? He said they gather the people just for the sake of gathering them into a party. He said thereafter you will not find them teaching them the true deen. They don't teach them the aqidah or the manhaj. And if, even if they do it, it is superficial and there's no cultivation upon that da'wah. That's why they have no tamiz in their da'wah. Today they'll sit with the Diyabandi, tomorrow with the grave worshipper, the day after with the Shi'i, the fourth day with the socialist, fifth day with the, with the liberal. Because the whole of their da'wah now is based upon political expediency. This is the da'wah of these organizations. This is what Sheikh Al-Fawzan, and these questions are aimed at Sheikh Al-Fawzan, is clarifying the position of the ulama and the salaf in this affair. <clears throat> so he said, the fiqh of the occurrences which is the fiqh of the occurrences and current events that required judgments. That fiqh, you need to have that fiqh. You need to know how to deal with those kind of situations. And it is the implementation of the Sharia rulings upon them in a manner that is correct because you can see a current event and react to it in a manner that completely opposes the kitab and the sunnah. So you got the waqi bit right. It's, a, it's an event taking place but you got the fiqh completely wrong. Because you're reacting towards this, this event that has taken place in a manner that opposes the kitab and the sunnah. <clears throat> then Jamal al-Harithi, rahimahullah, he said, as for what they call fiqh al they intend by that to occupy the people with the affairs of politics and criticism of the rulers and to incite tribulation and unrest and discord and to destabilize, na destabilize nations and societies. So they attach this term, fiqh al in order to deceive the people. And this is nothing new from them, he said, because their predecessor and their leader, Sayyid Qutb, spoke with the term fiqh al He spoke with the term. In his book, which they regard to be a tafsir, and it's not a tafsir, it's a distortion. Fi dhilal al-Qur'an. Fi dhilal al-Qur'an is his interpretation of what the Qur'an means. So in volume three, in his, uh, uh, when he discusses Surah Yusuf, under the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where Yusuf said, Aj'alni ala khaza'in al-ard, inni hafizun alim. Ayah number 55 in Yusuf. Where Yusuf, Yusuf salam, he said, put me in charge of the storehouses of the land and I will indeed look after them with full knowledge. So, after this, Sayyid Qutb said in his interpretation, he said, Islamic fiqh arose in an Islamic society and it arose during political activism in this society meaning in this generation in Egypt, in response to the needs of the lives of the Muslims in current times. So the fiqh al-haraka, which is the political activism and the fiqh of, pol of politics and movements, differs fundamentally from the fiqh of the religious texts. So what has he done? He's put a divide straight in there. This is Sayyid Qutb. And this is why only really takes a scholar an alim. This is why Sheikh Rabi wrote book after book after book, slicing the manhaj and the aqidah of Sayyid Qutb apart so the people see what this man was doing. So in this, he has mentioned Sayyid Qutb. So the fiqh al-haraka, which is the, the fiqh of, the, of political activism and agitation, differs fundamentally from the fiqh of the religious texts. And the fiqh of, the, of, of, the polit of political activism and due to it is derived the term al-waqi' concerning which 
the revelation was sent and the rulings derived. So he's divided it up, saying that as with regard to the, the political knowledge and political activism, there is a fiqh for that. And this is what they were trying to nurture the youth upon, even in the, even in the 19th, from the time of Hassan al-Banna, in the early part of the 20th century, up until he set up his organization in 1928 or thereabouts, when they set up Al-Ikhwan al-Muslimin, right up until Sayyid Qutb, when he became famous after he returned back from America, after he had got confused about religion and communism, and you know he was ringing church bells in, in America, Sayyid Qutb, when he was studying in the United States, that he used to go church to church because he was so confused about his religion. Even though he had become a hafiz as a youth, went to America to study, and he would go to dances just to see what they're doing. And then he got confused about Islam and doubted Islam. So then he learned how to ring church bells. Then he came back to Egypt and he swung the pendulum and swung completely the opposite way. So from there, he swung the opposite way up until he said there are no Muslims in the dunya. We are living in an ummah. The ummah today is ummah ghaiba. There is no ummah. It's an absent ummah. And all of the rulers are kuffar. And all of the imams of the masajid are kuffar. And all of the mu'addins are kuffar. Anyone who, anyone who lives under the rule of these rulers, then they are considered to be un meaning under the, and, and accepts the rule of these rulers. So the only ones that were saved were those who came under his banner, the vanguard. And this is why when you read the books of Sayyid Qutb, not that I advise you to read them, but when we first started practicing, these books were handed to us. They were handed out free. Milestones was a free book. Tens and thousands of copies handed out to the people in Britain, never mind America, and in, and in other languages such as French and German and Urdu and other languages. His books and Maududi's books. Milestones is just a tract from the teachings of, of the likes of Lenin. You know, it was, it was a basically a communist tract taking the ideas of Marxism and propagating them under the, under the veil of Islam. So, <clears throat> He finishes in this point by mentioning this affair. That this, this distinction between understanding the fiqh of the deen and understanding the waqi' it is without understanding the kitab and the sunnah and the way of the salaf, you can never have an answer to the events that are taking, uh, taking place around you. And just nurturing the youth upon the current political situation that is happening around you without any guidance. And this is why Sheikh al-Bani used to say, the best siyasa is to leave alone siyasa. Leave alone politics. Why? Because when you learn the aqidah, when you learn the methodology, you will see events taking place around you. And then you'll be able to contextualize them in light of usul al-sunnah, sharh al-sunnah, kitab al-sunnah, aqidah al-tahawiyah, Al-Shari'a wa al-Ajuri, the books of Ibn Taymiyyah, the books of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, the writings of Sheikh bin Baz, the writings of Sheikh Muqbil. You'll begin to understand and contextualize how do I deal, in the, deal with the people in the society that I'm living in? How do I deal with the fact that, for example, we are Muslim minorities living in the West under Kafir rule, almost unheard of in the history of Islam? The amount, the, the, the numbers of, and the populations of Muslims that are living under kafir rule today is almost, and Allah knows best, that there is not a time in history since the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam till now that so many, not, so many Muslims are living under non-Muslim rule. Tens of millions of them across Europe. Three million in Britain, five million in, or four or five million in, in, in France, another four to five million in Germany. Look at this. That's just three countries and you've got nearly 15 million Muslims. When you consider that some of the populations, I think the population of Saudi must be, what, 30 million? Between 20 and 30 million. Imagine, Europe has, has Europe, the Muslims in Europe outnumber in terms of population some of the Muslim countries. Then you got how many millions of Muslims living in the US, then South America, then in the Caribbean, in India. There's more Muslims living in India, in Darul Kufr, than they are in Pakistan. Pakistan population is 200 million. More than 200 million Muslims live in India. 
So these are real events, you know, these are real situations that Muslims have to live in. You know, laws that ban you from doing things that are part of your religion. You know, situations where you can't travel, you can't settle, maybe you can't work in certain jobs, or that the, from above, there's, there are pressures being put on Muslims, Islamic profiling or Muslim profiling, banning of the hijab. These are real events that take place. How does a Muslim deal with them? Can they deal with these affairs independently of the kitab and the sunnah without studying the aqidah, without studying the manhaj, without studying the fiqh of the salaf, without studying the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa how he was in Mecca and Medina? And that's why all of the scholars, they mention the importance of studying the seerah of Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa Because that gives you an idea of how the Prophet sallallahu not an idea, it gives you a, a deep insight into how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa behaved when he was living under the kuffar at the beginning of Revelation. And then how he lived with them when he was giving da'wah to them. How he lived with them in a state of oppression. How he lived with them when he lost the strength of his tribe after the death of Abu Talib. How the Prophet Sallallahu then had to migrate, the issue of migration. Then the Prophet Sallallahu in Medina and how he lived in Medina in the early years. At the Battle of Badr when they were small in number and the enemy was large. And then all the attacks and the assassination attempts upon the Prophet ﷺ and then Abu Bakr and so on. And then when you, end, when, you, when you look at the life of the Prophet ﷺ, when Islam became stronger and stronger and stronger and events were taking place, an army of, of the Prophet ﷺ went to the battle of you know, Mu'tah. And they fought the Christian Roman Empire. And they were victorious. They didn't take any land from them, but the word spread, these people are serious. And that was, you know, when many of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, like Ja'far, Abdullah bin Rawaha, Zayd bin Haritha, they were killed at this battle. And it was under Khalid bin Walid that they tactically were victorious and they returned back to Medina as victorious Believers against the Roman Empire? How did the Prophet ﷺ react? How did they behave under all these threats, all these victories, all these losses, all these threats? Seerah. And then the death of the Prophet ﷺ. Then how did Abu Bakr take on the rule? So reading the seerah in the context of the kitab and the sunnah and understanding the aqidah, understanding the methodology, that's the fiqh you need to know. Then when events take place around you, it will come to your mind. How was the Prophet ﷺ in this situation? Let me go and ask the scholars. This is why fiqh al there is no one more aware of the implementation and the tatbiq of the kitab and the sunnah in situations of hardship and difficulty and trials and tribulations more than the scholars. More than the scholars. And even though the scholars may differ in their approach, but they are united in the methodology. Meaning that they may differ in what to do. Shall we call the Americans or not? Sheikh al-Albani said, don't call them. We don't need them. Sheikh bin Baz said, yes, we need them. Did they differ? They differed. Was it a Nazila? It was a Nazila. One scholar said one thing, one scholar said another thing. But who, had, who was correct out the two? How does a person real, you know, understand and how does a person... You know, come to the conclusion, was Albani right or Bin Baz? Obviously, the army ain't going to know. Because the army, it's not his, it's not his thing. But the Talib Ilm, he looks at what Sheikh Bin Baz said about calling the Americans to defend the kingdom of Saudi Arabia against the attack of the Ba'athist army of Saddam Hussein. So Sheikh Bin Baz spoke, Sheikh Al-Albani spoke. And what won the day was Sheikh Bin Baz because... The proofs and the evidences were with him in this particular issue. That's why Sheikh Rabi wrote a defense of the position of Sheikh bin Baz. Isti'ana bil kuffar. The permissibility of seeking the aid of the unbelievers. Uh, a, a short booklet by Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Rabi. Hafidhullah ta'ala. And Sheikh bin Baz himself explained his position. And he gave evidence after evidence. Of, he said this is allowed in the Sharia. With conditions. And he said, lay down the conditions because that is another aspect of fiqh al You know, there are very few absolutes. Things are restricted. Things have conditions. 
It's not these juhal who are going to do that for you. It's the scholars. Barakallahu feekum. So upon that note, inshallah, we'll finish for today. Which is Akumullah khairan. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Barakallahu feekum. Barakum salam. Kif al-hal. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Barakallahu feekum. Yeah. It is not permissible for a Muslim to send his children to a state school when that state school involves, in, uh, involves the children or teaches the children things that are against the religion of Islam. And this is what state schools do. Celebration of Christmas, Diwali, you know, some of the celebrations of the Hindus and Sikhs and Christians and so on. And they even celebrate uh, Eid Milad Nabi. So the celebrations of the kuffar and the celebrations of the mubtadi'ah. Then, these ideas of Darwinism and evolution. Imagine teaching the children at the age of five and six this. Right from the early stages, they're being indoctrinated into rejecting the creator and creationism. So no, barakallahu feekum. Put your children into Islamic schools. That is wajib. Or you educate them at home, teaching, teaching them the subjects that they need to learn in the context of the Islamic faith <clears throat> so that the faith is not compromised. As for some of the reasons why splitting from Green Lane, there's no... They split from the Sunnah. Barakallahu <clears throat> feekum. And... Uh, there are several audios that are available on salafisounds.com salafisounds.com and just type in Green Lane Mosque and I'm sure you'll get several clips inshallah and likewise on my website if you go to abukhadij.com just type in into the search uh, Green Lane Mosque and you'll see the proofs and evidences that show their deviation <clears throat> Is this true that at the beginning of Salafi down in the UK, the Salafis were all one group and now split into many groups? No. Salafi was always small at the beginning. It was a small body of Salafis, maybe a thousand, two thousand maybe. <clears throat> Even the conferences, the early conferences that took place, Salafi conferences back in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, you know, two to two thousand people from the whole country used to gather, not all of them were Salafi anyway, uh, in Leicester and wherever else the conferences were held, even in Birmingham. Uh, <clears throat> as the Dawah began to grow, then it is true to say that some of, as the Dawah began to grow and the knowledge of Salafiyah began to increase and the knowledge of the scholars began to reach the United Kingdom through the likes of the translations of our brother, Sheikh Abu Talha Daud, Burbank, Hafiz Rahimahullah Ta'ala, and other than him, that when these translations started to filter through into the West and the knowledge became clearer, then some of those people who thought they were Salafis realized that they had misunderstandings and they weren't willing to give up that which they were upon. So they review, refused to embrace the true Salafiyyah as the knowledge comes to you because you can be upon a base understanding, Kitab, Sunnah, Sahaba, you know, just in terms of academic, uh, uh, you know, allegiance, then you would ally yourself to the Kitab, Sunnah, Sahaba, because that, those are just three words. But now, let's say, you say, uh, what do you follow? Kitab, kitab and Sunnah. Do you follow the Sahaba? Yes, I'm the Sahaba. You say, okay, you can't speak against the rulers. No, Akhi, I can't have that. But you said Kitab, Sunnah, Sahaba. Yeah, Kitab, Sunnah, Sahaba, but I don't accept that you can't speak against the rulers. Because the Prophet said you can't. No, 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 those rulers are different. These rulers are different. So, that, those kind of issues, yes, they led to people saying that, I don't, I don't, I don't want this da'wah. So is that a split in the Salafi da'wah? No. That's a deficiency in individuals who don't want to accept the fact that the Prophet forbade rebellion against the Muslim rulers. So, for example... You know, when the knowledge came that the Salaf of this Ummah, 
the likes of Barbahari, the likes of Ahmed, the likes of Ibn Mubarak, the likes of Fudayl, that they said you don't take knowledge from Ahlul Bid'ah. Now some of these Salafis were cooperating with Ahlul Bid'ah through FOSIS, which is a uh, you know, university organization run by Ikhwan al muslimin and they were working with them, their names were on their, on their podiums, and they were traveling around the country under their banner. So now the knowledge of the Salaf reaches us that you can't cooperate with Ahlul Bid'ah unless they accept the Haqq. They don't want to leave those groups and come to the Haqq. So you say to them, you can't cooperate with Ahlul Bid'ah. They said, no, Akhi. He said, Kitab Sunnah Sahaba, here's Kitab Sunnah Sahaba. No, Akhi, no, 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 I've, I've got close to those. Some of them are my friends. And who are they? Ikhwanis, Takfiris, Sufis. From them was Suhaib Hassan. Wouldn't leave. He wouldn't leave. I'm not going to leave Fawsis. I'm not going to leave Sayyid Darsh. Sayyid Darsh was an Ash'ari Sufi. He used to invite him to his masjid, Masjid Tawheed. Imagine. Masjid Tawheed inviting an Ash'ari Sufi in Ramadan. You know, just like, you know, we have, sometimes we give lectures after the Salah to give a lecture to the people. That's what they were doing. So you tell him this is, this is not allowed. You're inviting not even an army from them. This is one of their big scholars. Sayyid Darsh was one of the big scholars of the Ashaira Sufiya, Syrian or something. I can't remember which Jinsiya, but anyway. And he was living in the UK, just like Sayyid Hassan, for many years. An elderly man. And he used to let him come and give the Rus. So he said, no, I'm a student of Sheikh bin Baz. I will ask Sheikh bin Baz. So he said, okay, here's the question. So the brothers compiled a question, sent it to Sheikh bin Baz from Suhaib Hassan, because Suhaib Hassan's father used to be close, Suhaib Hassan's father used to be close to Sheikh bin Baz, Abdul Ghaffar Hassan, Rahimahullah. So Suhaib Hassan wrote a letter thinking that Sheikh bin Baz would uh, allow him to continue cooperating with Ahlul Bida. So the question was, there are many groups in the UK, Ikhwan al-Muslimin, Jamaat al-Tabligh, Hizb al-Tahrir, uh, Jamaat al-Jihad, and the Salafis. Is it allowed for us to cooperate, for the Salafis to cooperate between each other because we are a minority and so on and so forth. Sheikh Bin Baz said, no, you cannot cooperate except with those who are upon the manhaj of the Salaf. As for the others, then invite them to the truth. If they, invite, if they come to the truth and they accept the Salafi da'wah, then yes, you can cooperate with them. He got the answer. He kept the answer to himself. We didn't see it for about nine, ten months. Someone from Kuwait came and he said, MashaAllah, you brothers asked a question to Sheikh Bin Baz. He said, yeah. He said, did you read the answer? He said, no, you sheikh. He said, no, the answer is it's, uh, it's present. They've, obviously, in those days, there's no internet and stuff. So they said, no, no, it's present. Let me, let, me, let me get it for you. Had it faxed through. And there's the answer. He hid it from us. He got the answer. So when you talk about splits in the Salafi Dawah, it's not splits. As the knowledge is coming to the people, this is mid-90s, right? Early 90s, mid-90s. As the knowledge is coming to the people, Hakimiyah. So they come with the fourth category, who these Ikhwanis and Qutubis and Saruris, they're trying to push this Hakimiyah upon, onto the Salafis. Who? Jamiyat Ihiyat Turath. So Jamiyat Ihiyat Turath, they infiltrated an organization that was famous in the UK in that time for Salafiyyah, Jamiyat Ihiyat Minhaj Sunnah, Jimas. And their leader was a man by the name of Abu Muntasir. We used to know him quite well, he's very well, in fact part of uh, the da'wah scene and he was, our, he was older than us, our elder in terms of the da'wah and he used to travel around giving knowledge and so on and so forth so he was infiltrated initially he was with the scholars but he made friends with an individual in the United States called Ali Tamimi Ali At-Tamimi Ali At-Tamimi he made contact with Safar al-Hawali and more so Salman al-Awda so when he made contact with Salman al-Awda, khalas, he went in the direction of those Qutubiyin. So I remember meeting him once. The year slips my mind, but I would have thought we're looking at early 1996 or 1996, there's about. So Abu Munsir invited me, he said, listen, Birmingham, you know, we need to cooperate, we need to. And I said, listen, I'm done with you guys. We're finished. I said, you make ta'an in Sheikh, Rabi, Sheikh al-Albani. He said, no, no, you know, because he made some comments about Sheikh al-Albani that were disparaging. This is Abu Muntasir. No, 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 just, just this once. If you sit with him this once, done. With Ali Tamimi. Because Ali Tamimi was extremely eloquent. And he studied in Medina for about a year or something like that. 
So he came to Birmingham. From Birmingham, he just gave salam and they went to Leicester. He said, are you coming? I said, I said, khalas, okay, I'll sit. So I took a tape recorder in those days, actual tape recorder. So I put the tape recorder, he put us in a room with him, myself and another brother from Birmingham, Manali Tamimi. He said, so the rest of them, they said, okay, we're going to leave you. He's going to tell you whatever you need to know. So I put the tape recorder on. So I said, what's the issue? What's wrong with Sheikh bin Baz? What's wrong with Sheikh? Nothing wrong with them, mashallah. They're our scholars and so on and so forth. And I thought, I've come all the way from Birmingham. This man's wasting our time. They're not really saying anything. Then I realized there's a recorder. So I stopped the recorder. And obviously, you know, spy devices went. There's no light. You can't, it's not a phone. So it's a machine. Click and you turn the thing off. I took the tape out and I put it down. I said, I said will you talk to us now? He said, khalas. Okay, I'll tell you. And then he started attacking Sheikh Muqbil. He said, don't even mention that man's name in front of me. He said, and then he started talking about, the, about what they're really upon. He said, there is a global movement that has infiltrated the Salafi da'wah. It is filled with spies, CIA, infiltrated. The same spies that are operating in the Muslim lands. And uh, the scholars in Medina that you refer to, they are from them. So obviously he's referring to uh, Sheikh Rabi and Sheikh Ubaid and those scholars. And I said, oh, that Sheikh bin Baz, bin Baba Aula must be one of them because he actually works for the government. Because Sheikh Rabi was just a uh, professor at the Islamic University. Sheikh bin Baz is the mufti, head of the legina, part of the ministry of Islamic affairs. He goes, no, 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 Sheikh bin Baz, he just doesn't know. He doesn't know. They just feed him and he doesn't know. He said, soon you're going to see assassinations of leading true Muslim scholars. I haven't seen one since, to be honest. I've, I don't know of any Muslim scholar that's been assassinated. But anyway, so I said, well, I said, Zakallah, at least you spilt the beans. You know, you told us what you told us. So we left him and we returned back to Birmingham. A few days later, I emailed him and I said, everything that you've said, there's no proof for it. Because I said to him, you know, I'll contact you, I'll email you. So I emailed him. I said, what you've said, there's no proof for it, no evidence for it. You spoke about Tawheed al hakimiyah as a fourth category. You didn't bring any proof for it. You just introduced it as a fourth category, distinct from the other categories. So I said, uh, I, said I, I, I gave you the respect that you asked for on that day. I didn't shout or scream. I asked you the, the, the serious questions. You gave the answers. The answers weren't really, they were just conspiracies and attacks against the scholars. You know, you didn't leave a, you didn't leave a scholar. Not one. Who can you trust? Apart from Salman al-Awda, Safar al-Hawali said, I'd never met him, but I do speak to him on the phone. You know, and that was Ali tamimi Several years later, after 9-11, he got arrested and he got banged up for 130 years. I think they just released him the other day because the, the sentence was overturned. But this is, when you talk about splits in the Salafi da'wah, what's happening in reality is that there's a body of brothers, Salafis, and as the knowledge is coming, knowledge of Imam al-Ajuri, Fudayl ibn Iyad, Abdul Mubarak, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. This is now reaching us. More and more students, Abu Hakim, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, was studying at the Islamic University of Medina. He, he joined in 1994. By 1996, he was second, third year. He was well known to Sheikh Rabi. And uh, we were visiting the Mamlaka quite often by 96, uh, 97, 98. It was almost two or three times a year that we were visiting. So the, the Mashaykh, as the knowledge was reaching us, knowledge of Sheikh bin Baz, Ibn Uthaymeen, we met Sheikh Muqbil, rahimahullah ta'ala. Of course, Sheikh uh, Rabi and Sheikh uh, uh, Ubaid were constants in our lives. We did a telelink with Sheikh uh, Ibn Uthaymeen. Uh, even before that, in the mid-90s, there were telelinks, not organized by us, but we were present with uh, Sheikh Abdulaziz bin Baz. So that was taking place constantly. Sheikh Muqbil was a constant in our da'wah. Alhamdulillah, almost every conference, Sheikh Muqbil would give a, a, a dars for us. And many of our brothers traveled. Abu Fudayl went to Yemen. Abu Tasneem went to Yemen. Abu Abdullah Bilal Hussein went to Yemen. And a handful of other brothers from our community in Birmingham went to Yemen. Hassan al-Somali went to Yemen. So Abu al-Hassan Malik and others. So they became close to Sheikh Muqbil. And even in the, in the writings of Sheikh Muqbil till this date, he's mentioned questions from Birmingham. And those are questions from our conferences, you know. Uh, or whatever they were called. 
So that was a, it was a difficult time because there was huge amounts of upheaval taking place because the Qutubis and the Sururis and the Ikhwanis were pushing and pushing against our da'wah and inf infiltrating. Remember, we never had this masjid. We were at Green Lane. That's where we were praying Jum'ah. Where else are we going to pray? In 1998, we set up the uh, first markas on Mun Street where you is, is now and next door, both of the shops. The whole of the downstairs was the bookstore just like the frontier on Comtree Road. And upstairs was the markas. So when they banned us from Green Lane, we moved to here and then the Darus, Abu Talha, and predominantly myself and Abu Talha because Abu Hakim was in Medina. And then when Abu Hakim came back in the summer, then there were three of us giving Darus. And some of the Mashaikh used to come from Kuwait and elsewhere, even from Saudi, of the Islam Barjis and others. But they came and they saw the efforts in the Dawah, the conferences, we still did them even though we didn't have a masjid. And those conferences, we did one at the uh, rec center here. You know, and the numbers started growing rapidly and the book started getting published and the Dawah became clearer and clearer and clearer. So instead of actually the numbers reducing, the clearer the Dawah became, the greater the increase in numbers of people embracing the Dawah. Why? Because the more knowledge there is, the purer the Dawah, the cleaner the Dawah, the more that it is based in the sources of the religion, Kitab, Sunnah, Sahaba, the more sincere people get attracted to it. So in the early days, when we first started giving the Rus in Green Lane, I think in the first uh, year or so, what, seven people maximum, four people on a, you know, generally in a dars. Imagine, you're sitting there going through a book and there's four, and you're one of the four. Or Abu Talha's uh, circles, seven people, eight people. Some, you know, and then, you know, obviously if there, was a, if there was an event like a winter conference or a summer event, you know, we used to, they used to allow us to use Green Lane in those days because <clears throat> I don't think they understood English very well for, for whatever reason. We were using their facilities when they realized what we were doing, then they uh, basically removed us from the masjid. They said, oh no, you're causing fitna and you're, you're, you're warning against us and so on. So we had several meetings with them. Myself, I was present. Abu Muawiyah Saftar Khan was present. Abu Junaid, Yusuf Bowers was present. Try to think who else. But anyway, that's what I recall. So in, through those meetings, we realized that these people are basically upon the manhaj of Ikhwan al Muslimin. Come under our banner or get out. And that was the ultimatum. So eventually, they planted an individual who caused wreaked havoc on one of the nights in Ramadan. And they wrote a letter to us saying that all of you Durus are banned. You can come here, but you can't sit. You can't sit in groups. You can't. So it was like one of those, uh, you know, regime style dictatorships or authoritarian. You can't even sit in a group of two kind of thing. So anyway, by that time, we, we managed to get the markas and the dawah it spread. And then from as soon as we started the dawah here, then the numbers 20, 30, 40. By the time I think Abu Hakim came back for the, after the markas was built, there was no more room in the markas for the people to sit. Every room upstairs, there was about six or seven rooms upstairs, oh, one, two, three, four, about five rooms upstairs, and the whole of the ground floor packed, and the two rooms in the back. Every inch was filled with people. And that was after one year after being removed from that masjid. So, we've, so even though a person may think to himself, well, they removed you, you had no place to give da'wah, but actually it aided the da'wah because people saw even more clarity. There was no extremism, there was no harshness, everyone was welcome. The Durus, Abu Talha used to teach Riyadh al-Salihin, he used to read from a silsila Hadith al-Sahih of Shaykh al-Albani, Sahiha. He used to uh, teach Kitab al-Tawheed. Uh, I taught my lessons. Abu Hakim, when he used to come, used to teach his lessons. And the da'wah grew and it flourished up until we are where we are today. With with thousands of Salafis in Birmingham now and tens of thousands across the country. And all it takes really is sabr, patience, ikhlas, remaining uh, without compromising the deen of Allah, remaining firm upon the kitab and the sunnah, upon istiqamah, and Allah blesses the da'wah. And even if the numbers don't increase, you're still upon the haqq, right? It's not based upon numbers. Jazakumullahu khairan wa subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.